you are just so cuddly today and it is adorable. Can you see her? I hope you can see her because it's, I mean, look at this face. I would buy you whatever you wanted. Do you want your own pony? I don't know what you do with it, but I'll get it for you. Hi kids, welcome back to another Pete's party. I'm Mrs. Pizza and let's do a reading wrap up because if I wait too long and there's too many books, it's overwhelming. So let's do this while it's still somewhat normal. All right. So the first book we are going to talk about is The Other Bell, and that is by Whitney G. This is a loose, loose Beauty and the Beast retelling. Basically, I didn't really enjoy this because this is supposed to be a fantasy romance where the Belle or the Beauty is actually the sister of Beauty in the story, and she falls for Gaston or the Gaston-like character while her sister runs off with the beast. But this felt like a fever dream. This felt like somebody did a bunch of acid and told a whole bunch of random nuggets of fairy tale that they like pulled out of their psyche. It was so disjointed and it was just like stuff would happen and I'd be like, oh, okay, I guess because fairy tale. Oh, Rumpelstiltskin's gonna show up just for five seconds. Does not push the plot forward at all. Has nothing to do with anything. Because fairy tale. Oh, that happened? Because fairy tale. And in this one, the good guys were the bad guys and the bad guys were less bad guys. But the whole premise of the story was supposed to be like, you know, it's twist. It's a twisty, twisty fantasy romance because she ends up with the bad guy. But she didn't. He wasn't really the bad guy. The good guys were the from Beauty and the Beast were the bad guys. Like Belle was a bad guy. Her dad was a bad guy. The Beast was a bad guy. I read a lot of Beauty and the Beast retellings. This was not a good one. Don't don't waste your time. I ended up giving it two stars. But I read it. Hooray! The next book I picked up after that was Ninth House by Lee Bardugo. I talked about this one at length in a reading vlog where I read this one and its sequel, Hellbent, which I read as well. And it is the first book, Ninth House, is the story of Alex Stern. Alex goes to Yale to work for a secret society that is in charge of making sure all of the other secret societies at Yale are doing what they're supposed to be doing, following the rules, you know? But at this Yale, in this world, magic exists and the secret societies are practicing it. So Alex is brought on and given a fake backstory because she did not, she did not have aspirations of going to college. Alex is from the wrong side of the tracks and she's been running with a rough crowd. She wasn't going to, there was no college in her future. But because she has the ability to see ghosts, which sounds horrific, and it is horrific in, in the book. It's not made to be like a fun superpower. It's horrific. And it's it's portrayed as being horrific. At least some of the time. Alex is given a fake backstory brought to Yale by the Secret Society. And then mysteries happen. Secret, so secret societies up to no good. Y Yale. This is touted as a dark academia, but that is a kind of a buzzword phrase right now. People hear dark academia and they get excited. This is more fantasy heavy, more mystery heavy. There is that little bit of dark academia in there, but it's not like when I think dark academia, I think this one. Babel by RF Kwan. That is more dark academia. Ninth House and Hellbent are, they live next door. Dark academia adjacent is what I'm going to call it. I really enjoyed Ninth House and Hellbent. I think I liked Ninth House a little bit more, but I also had the benefit of reading them back to back. And I listened to the audiobook for Ninth House. And I've had a lot of people tell me they really enjoyed the book via audiobook. So that's the route I went. I had a great time. I'm excited for the next one. It can't get here fast enough. The next book I picked up after that is going to be Mixed Signals by B.K. Borson. And this is number three in the Love Light Farm series. The first one being Love Light Farms. The second one being In the Weeds. And then we have Mixed Signals. In Mixed Signals, we have 
Holy moly. What? How can I forget their names? I loved this one. I really did. I enjoyed this one. We have Layla who runs the bakery at Love Light Farms and she is obviously introduced in the first book because she works at the farm. Layla is not doing so great in the romance department. She's been on a lot of dud dates. I mean, some of these guys, one guy like pretty sure he used like a, a lint roller on her before she was allowed to get in the car. We start the story off with her basically at a really awful, awful date at a nice restaurant. And she is kind of rescued from having to find a way home by Caleb. Now, Caleb used to be a police officer in the town, but was fired for being too nice. So he now works at the high school. He has also been introduced kind of slightly in one of the earlier books. Kayla? <laughs> Kayla? Who's Kayla? I just, that would be like Brangelina. That would be their couple name, Kayla. Layla and Caleb are both sunshines. No, one of the biggest kind of tropes in romance that's super popular is a grumpy sunshine. This is a sunshine sunshine. And I'd never read one before. Let me tell you, it's top tier. <laughs> it was absolutely adorable. Both of these people are lovely and sweet and just want to find love. And it was stinking cute. Also baked goods. I have loved this whole series so far. And I highly recommend it if you're looking for something sweet and fluffy and nice. It's not going to change the world. But if you're in a bad mood and you want to read about two people falling in love... The Love Light Farm series. Also, the first book takes place in winter. Second book takes place in spring. And this one, Mixed Signals, takes place in the summer. So our fourth book in the series, I'm pretty sure, is going to take place in the fall. And we already know what characters it's going to be. And I'm actually kind of interested, which is surprising because I didn't think I was going to be into it. But I think I'm into it. And if you like romance novels, highly recommend. Ooh. The next book I picked up after that one was The Fine Print, and this is Dreamlight Billionaires Number 1. These are by Lauren Asher. I actually DNF'd this. Before you come for me, let me explain. I was starting to feel a little slumpy, and this book was not helping, and I feel like this is a book I actually would enjoy. It is a grumpy sunshine. It is the story of a girl who works at a... It's Disney World, but it's not called Disney World. She works at this giant theme park and the CEO slash creator of this theme park was an older man who has since passed away and his three grandsons now take up the mantle of becoming the, you know, the dudes in charge. In this first book, the character, I don't feel like looking up their names. I DNF this. I will come back to this with wide open eyes next time and be pleasantly surprised by everything I've forgotten. But basically... All three grandsons each get a book when the grandfather passes away and wills them parts of this dreamland theme park. In this first book, he is tasked with basically having to come up with some new attraction for the park in order to inherit his part of the company. Each brother has to complete a task that is set forth in the will in order to get them big, big bucks. So... Our character ends up working with this quirky, fun girl who works at, it's basically the Bippity Boppity Boutique, which I may or may not have worked at at one point in my life, allegedly. So I was actually a little bit excited about this because I allegedly maybe have a little bit of an insight into working in that part of the park. That being said, I wasn't feeling this, so I DNF'd it for now. Like I said, no judging. I'll come back to it. I will. I'll come back. The next book I picked up after that was A Total Departure because, again, slumpy. So I decided to pick up something short and completely different, and I picked up Bina, which is number one in the Litten verse. This is by Nino Cipri. According to Google, that's how you pronounce it. If I'm getting it wrong, I apologize, and I'm a horrible person, but I tried my best. So this story takes place at a fake Ikea-esque type warehouse store retail giant and our main character Ava has recently broken up with a co-worker named Jules. Ava and Jules have worked at this fake Ikea for a while and one day a wormhole opens up and a customer accidentally wanders in. Ava and Jules have to travel through the wormhole to recover our our lost customer. And it's all very by the book and there's rules and it's Ikea. This sounded like a lot of fun. It's super short. And this is one of those things where it's a commentary on corporations, also about lives. It's They travel through the multiverse, but the wormhole's in an Ikea. 
It sounded a lot of fun. It, the concept was a lot more fun than the actual execution. It was fine. I had a good time and I think I would read more from this author, but it did not knock my socks off. I thought it was going to be more about the awkwardness of having to travel through the multiverse with your recent ex, but that seemed like it was kind of on the back burner. And I also thought we were going to get a lot more cool multiverse stuff and we didn't. But in a book this size, I think it was good for for being pretty short. And did it help me get through my slump? A little. It helped me get that serotonin hit I get when I finish a book. You know, completion. It gives us the good feelings. The next book I picked up after that was Winter's Orbit by Everina Maxwell. I had a physical copy of this book and I have since passed it on. This is a sci-fi. It's a lot more political intrigue sci-fi with a romance through line. I thought it was going to be a sci-fi romance with a heavier political kind of emphasis to it, but it wasn't. This is a sci-fi political story with a with a romance happening if that makes any sense. Basically, we were not romance forward at all, even though we were following these two people that have been recently married off to each other in a political alliance. We have Kaim is the least favorite prince of our current monarch. Grandmother of our prince has told him that he is basically going to be married off in this political alliance to the recently widowed Janan. Sounds complicated is. They also have a treaty going on at this current time, so they have to prove to this other kind of political police power that their alliance is not only, you know, strong, but not under duress. And then other things are happening. We're investigating maybe potentially that Janan's recently dead ex, I guess it wouldn't be your ex-husband, his recently dead former husband. Maybe he was murdered. Maybe he was involved in some shady business. Maybe Janan did it. Maybe Janan didn't do it. Who did it? This book was incredibly too long. So long. And it got to the point where I couldn't follow the twists and turns anymore. This could have really done with some editing. That being said, I really, really enjoyed all of the characters. Our two main characters, all of the side characters. I felt like everybody felt like they were making realistic choices and they were well-rounded, at least for the most part. And you didn't really know who was involved with the shady business and who wasn't involved in the shady business or even what the shady business really was. But then when you get really close to the end and you're like, none of this is making sense still, I haven't picked up any of the pieces, it was too long. And then I read that this started off as fan fiction and it made sense. I think this was good. I just don't think it needed to be this long. There, I said it. Also, the cover is beautiful. So there's that. The last book we are going to talk about today is my most recently finished one, and that is The Last House on Needless Street by Katrina Ward. I recently read Little Eve, which is way up on top of my bookcase, and I'm not going up there to get her. And so the book that put Katrina Ward into kind of my orbit of knowing about this author was actually The Last House on Needless Street because this was on everybody's top books of the year. I am not usually a thriller mystery type girly, but I'm trying to dip my toes in, but I'm only reading the books that people rant and rave about because some of these books that I've read that everybody's like, yeah, that's pretty good. I hate it. I hate it. And I am already book slumping. I don't need books I hate to be on this. There's too many good books out there. I want to waste my time on a book I'm going to hate. I decided to pick up The Last House on Needless Street after really enjoying Little Eve. I listened to this on audio and I highly, highly recommend it. This is the story of three points of views. We have Ted, who lives in The Last House on Needless Street. He is a little strange, loses chunks of time, and overall, some something's off. He seems like a sweet character, but something, something ain't right. Then our other point of view is Olivia, Ted's cat. And our third point of view is Dee. And Dee's sister went missing quite a few years earlier. I think it was like 12 years prior to the beginning of this book at a local lake when the family was there on vacation. And Dee suspects that Ted had something to do with it. So we are following Ted, his cat, and Dee. Now, Ted starts spiraling when Dee moves into the house across from his on Needless Street. Being inside Ted's head and Olivia's head and even Dee's head, holy moly. 
I had my theories basically from the beginning of this, and I ended up being mostly right. I was still very impressed by the twists and turns, but I felt very vindicated that I picked up on some of the hints that Katrina, Miss Ward, Miss Ward if you feel it nasty, that was a Janet Jackson reference. <laughs> and I do not expect you to get it. This is one of those books that I feel like a lot of people will, the second time when they go back for that that reread after knowing the twists and turns and where the book ends up are going to start realizing things along the way that you're like, oh my gosh, from the beginning, from the beginning, they were letting me know. I enjoy the crap out of this book. And I will say this is probably going to be one of my favorite books of the year. It was so twisty and good and sad and dark. And the way that this author describes things especially how they use different types of descriptions from different characters. How, I, and I talked, I talked about this with someone recently with Little Eve. When you're going through the book, the age of the person that's giving the descriptions, the mental state of the person giving the descriptions, it, it, it changes based on who's speaking. And it's, <sighs> Katrina Ward's really good at her job and everybody needs to know that. I am a little apprehensive to pick up the other book that is out by this author. I believe it is called Sundial because there is a trigger warning that I am sensitive to, but it, uh, it makes me real. I really want to do it because I've really liked both of her books so far. I mean, this book, if you are the least bit interested, pick it up. Pick it up. So good. So freaking good. But that, kids, is going to be the end of this pizza party. Winnie's been passed out this entire time. She's just making a lot of noise just off screen. She's not going to visit us today while we're filming. I promise she still exists. But we're going to let her get her naps in because we've got some dogs coming to do some... We're going to be pet sitting and have four dogs in my house and two birds. It's fine. It's going to be a wild ride. We're going to just have to vacuum a lot because there's going to be a lot of fur. <sighs> but hopefully I get a lot of reading time. But I hope you're reading good books out there wherever you are. And I'll see you next time.